So last Sabbath, we began a, a study on the King of the North. We're going to uh, basically uh, build a, a case, okay? Uh, and we're going to build the case by using principles. Uh, you know, you might say, well, why can't we just, why can't we just get to it? You know, why can't you say Daniel 11, 45, is it not, or is it is, you know, why, why can't that be done? Well, I would just say that as an example, let's say we were going to go climb, uh, El Capitan in Yosemite national park, one of the, uh, greatest walls, climbing walls in the world, uh, where, not too long ago, uh, people uh, were able to uh, climb that whole wall in two and a half hours. I forget the man's name. He climbed it free solo in about two and a half hours, climbed a route, which would take other climbers of less experience as much as three to four days. The man climbs it in two and a half hours free solo. Okay, that's amazing. All right, but how could he do something like that? Well, through lots of preparation, lots of practice. So in essence, you know, when we're dealing in prophecy, we're doing something dangerous here, okay? Um, and we don't just step into something without first understanding the nature of it and the measures necessary for success or failure, okay? Uh, we have to be very careful about what we're doing here. I take this very seriously of the direction that we're getting ready to go because what will be shared as we continue here is more than likely, I doubt hardly any of you have ever heard this before, okay? And so I'm not doing this to be witty or original. That's not why I'm doing it. I'm doing it because I feel a burden has been laid upon me that I must do it. Somebody, interesting enough, sent me uh, the story of, I don't know if you've heard of Hazen Foss. Anybody know about Hazen Foss? Hazen Foss was appealed to three times to give the message that was ultimately laid upon Ellen White. And he didn't do it. And, and it was passed on. And then when he would have done it, when he finally realized he should do it, he could no longer do it. Uh, so some of the things that we're going to get into were brought to my attention years ago now. Uh, I did not do it. But I feel like, well, I sort of did it. But I, I didn't go full scale and uh but but now i see there is a real need to do that so since we're in dealing in eternal realities brethren it behooves us to work with strong principles okay just like a good climbing rope okay uh, and if you were so daring to even free climb that would be without a rope you better be sure and well practiced of your technique okay so there's danger here and where we're going when we deal in prophecy. This is just no small matter. And it's amazing to me at how lightly and flippantly people will treat these things and, uh, and, and, and proceed without any principle, okay? So if we break into ideas that are not firmly fixed by principle, then we're dangerous. Now, we would be no different uh, and perhaps it's, it's been all over the news, this whole thing with the uh, uh, ocean gate, the, the submersible that was going down to view the Titanic where the CEO perished and two billionaires, five people perished in the collapse of this submersible, um, risking his life and the lives of others, although being admonished over and over again that there were problems with what he was doing, he kept doing it because he was determined that he wanted to be original. He wanted to he wanted to break the boundaries of uh, the known physics of what was necessary to go as deep as he was going. He would not submit himself to uh, any kind of regulation or any kind of testing because he felt like that was holding him back. So the Lord has given us, in a spiritual sense, has given us principles not to hold us back, but to keep us safe, especially leaders, those that would try to share and expound the word of God definitely need to be operating in principle, or we can lead people much like the CEO of OceanGate to their demise while they think they're on a nice trip, okay? And I don't want to do that here. I, I do take very seriously what we're doing. So um, let's pray, and then let's get into this principle that we're going to deal with this evening. 
Father, I come to you in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and I thank you for your great love to us. I thank you that, as Brother Raul has mentioned in his presentation, that not a sparrow falls to the ground without your knowledge. The very hairs of our head are numbered. All things work according to your will and your purpose. The affairs of men are, in essence, governed by you, even when men don't realize that the affairs are even being governed by you. And none of us are here by accident this evening. None of us are living at this time by accident. We all have a purpose and a place. I just pray that by your grace we would fulfill it. And I ask that the message that would be brought tonight, the principle that would be brought out, would be clearly understood, that you give wisdom to each and every one of us, and you wouldn't hold it back, that our minds would be open, and that you'd give me the words to speak that would be a blessing. I do always claim the promise that where two or more are gathered in your name, that there you are in the midst. We believe that promise, even though we are separated, that you will be with us, Jesus, to guide and direct us and counsel us. And so we commit all these things into your hands, and we pray this in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the glory of our Heavenly Father. Amen. So as we begin, I'm going to take us to a document here. We're going to talk about the doctrine of providence. This is something that I came across, I guess, about two years ago. And I presented these ideas as we were looking at the three angels' messages reexamined. And after we had our study last Sabbath, and I was meditating over, you know, um, what might have been problematic if there were any problems in it or what might have been left out. This is what came to me. The thought came to me, you also have to deal with the principle of providence. Because if people don't understand the principle of providence, it's not just, you know, that, you know, God is providentially working for us, but the principle of providence as it works with prophecy, the prophetic time that we all say that we're dealing in. If we don't understand this, then we have no defense against the wind of doctrines that blow. So I'm going to go through this. Where did this come from or where did I first discover it? What happened was James White in 1850 put together a conglomeration of review, Advent Review articles that had been published around the time of the giving of the first angel's message and even past the disappointment, showing the mindset of the brethren who were now beginning to forsake the Advent doctrine. They had believed that Christ was coming, but now they're beginning to believe that they either had been mesmerized or that somehow the devil was working in it. And so James White puts together this tract, the Advent Review containing thrilling testimonies in 1850, a conglomeration of different people that had written during that time. And this Doctrine of Providence is one of those very articles that was in that tract, and that's how I discovered it. And when I read this, I was absolutely amazed and realized that there really can be no other than this. This is how it is. And so let's read through and discuss the principles as we go through here and see just how sure and how fast our message would have to be if this is the mindset that I believe is the truth. The doctrine of providence. The channel in which this mighty overheaving tide of cause and effect, purpose and accomplishment flows, is the sure word of prophecy. Prophetic truth is the track on which Jehovah's providential chariot has ever rolled. On this track, it will roll till it reaches the Grand Depot. Now, what will be the Grand Depot? That will be the second coming of Jesus Christ and us going home. By taking heed to the sure word of prophecy, we may see in what direction God is driving his, to most men, dreadful agencies and toward what grand consummation his plan of providence is tending. By watching in the light of revealed truth for the intermediate objects on the way to the consummation, we may know how many we have passed and how few we have yet to pass. And that is a very important concept to keep in mind and will continue to kind of be reiterated as we go through this, God has given us prophecy 
so that once we pass a certain point, then we know, okay, we've come this far. There's some things in the future. Have we crossed them or not? And as we cross them, then we know how much closer we are to that midnight hour when Jesus Christ comes. Prophecy is history in advance. History is the record of prophecy fulfilled. All the great kingdoms of the earth with their greatest changes, the first advent and the vicissitudes of the Christian church were sketched out by the pencil of prophecy about 2,000 or 2,000 years ago. That's 2,000 years ago. But now authentic history testifies to the fact that we have in the progress of providence past Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. The first advent and the predicted revolutions of the fourth empire, save one, which terminates its dreadful career. Thus, all history, as well as scripture, proves the declaration of the prophet of God. Surely the Lord will do nothing, but he revealed his secret unto or his secrets to his servants, the prophets. He unscales the prophet's eyes and opens to his view coming events. The historian sits to record them as they occur. Providence never mistakes, nor wheels round to roll by the predicted event the second time. Now, this is one of the biggest arguments I have heard come back when you deal with some of these things. Well, I believe it can happen again. Okay, well, I hope by the end of this evening, you will see that it's not how it works, okay? No, when the event has been recorded, it is like the deluge in the past. There is no second series of the four great empires, no second first advent, nor time of the end, which as we know is 1798. Now some are trying to say that's 1844. It's amazing what some ideas people are coming up with. Nor midnight cry. As for God, his way is perfect. Therefore, he never mends his ways. He fulfills his word at once and it is done forever. The prophetic sketch is sketched correctly. All the events of history harmonize with it in the order of sequence, in time, in manner. They all transpire as penciled by prophecy. The history of those nations which come within the range of prophetic vision attest the truth of the scriptural doctrine of providence. Now here I have put Daniel 2 with some asterisks. Okay, to call attention, Daniel 2 is the grand outline of how God would deal with the nations because he understood the failure of his people, the nation of Israel to do so after their captivity. Things would go in a different direction, okay? And so starting with Babylon, then Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and we know Rome in its pagan papal form, all the way down to the very end when the stone would smite the image on its feet, okay? And the everlasting kingdom being set up is the great grand outline of God's providential dealing with humanity, okay? And all the finer points that we uh, look at or all the prophetic events fall in that outline. And they are as certain as the rise and falls of the empires. They are figuratively displayed. They happen only once, okay? So we can understand this with Daniel chapter two. We can understand that Babylon was one time, Medo-Persia was one time, Greece now one time, Rome in its pagan form. Now we're living under the papal form of Rome, but we don't expect to go back and see a, a reliving of the empire of Greece again. We know better in that regard, okay? So if that be the case, then we can be certain the finer points of prophecy fitting into its grand outline are no different, okay? Let's keep that in mind. The heathen and all our race are comprehended within the range of those prophecies which relate to the consummation. But up to that period, prophecy more immediately, if not entirely, relates to those nations whose history is connected with God's people. The divine plan as sketched out in prophecy touching the first advent, the revolution of the Roman Empire, the apostasy and changes in the Christian church is fully sustained by the records of providence. The field of prophecy has been the theater of providence. The prophecy may be regarded as a conception of the specific event, 
Then the watchful eye of God is ever extended over it. His fostering hand cherishes the embryo till the set time and every event as minute as the falling of a sparrow and everything as vast as the dissolution of an empire or the destruction of the world will by the direction of providence concur to give it birth. To such events, there are no abortions, no counterfeit fulfillment. It either was or it was not. This is the issues that we really have to come to settle ourselves in as Seventh-day Adventist Christians. And just because a lot of time has passed as far as we can understand time, very little time has passed as God understands time. They are absolutely unique in their character. Each predicted event down the entire track of providence is as peculiar and as distinct from every other, as are the four great empires, as the first advent from the second. We can no more confound them, though we may be ourselves confused. So there are a lot of people that are confused, but we cannot confound God because he's not confused. He knows what he's doing. He goes on to say that we can confound the earth with its sun or the deluge with the final conflagration. Such is the astounding precision of the prophetic chart. And so in this example, he is referring to the 1843 chart. Now, I will call your attention to a couple of things on this chart that a lot of people today are trying to manipulate, which if you understand providence, cannot be manipulated or changed. The 1335 and the 1290, okay? Maybe you don't understand these numbers and what they represent, but there is a lot going on today to manipulate these numbers and try to use them. I'm gonna show you an example here in a little bit of just how witty some people can come up with these things. 508, which is referred to as the daily or the transition between paganism and papalism. Another big controversy and contingency among those that profess to be Seventh-day Adventists, okay? Also, and we're talking about the King of the North, we see very clearly here on the 1843 chart that they absolutely understood that the Ottoman Turk, starting with the Mohammedans, ultimately working its way to the Ottoman Turkish Empire, is a part of the providence of God. And that's what we're going to study, and that's what we're dealing in. But this was on that chart. Okay, Spirit of Prophecy tells us that there was a mistake. And for a long time, I didn't understand the nature of that mistake. The mistake is not 1843, because 1843 was by God's hand. It's a part of the first angel's message. The mistake was in their misunderstanding that the 2300-day prophecy would expire in October 22nd, 1844, and would be the opening of the investigative judgment. Okay, so that was the second angel's message where the correction was made. And then the third angel's message, then they began to understand the true nature of what all that meant. But brethren, this chart is providence, okay? God had it this way. This is the foundation. And I have seen consistently in one way or another, this is attacked, okay? But this is the foundations of what make us a people. And providence has dictated it as such. Such the wonderful accuracy with which providence fulfills the minutest touch of the prophetic pencil. The prophet, in harmony with the great teacher, Messiah, teaches us not to fear earth or hell, but to fear him who has set in order and told what is coming and shall come. Those who declare the truth of prophecy and show its harmony with history and passing events are God's witnesses. I want to read that again. Those who declare the truth of prophecy and show its harmony with history and passing events are God's witnesses. If they are not doing it, they are not God's witnesses. They are witnessing of something else. Now, granted, they may take up some aspects of the truth that we hold as a people. They may share those things. They may even share them powerfully. But if they are not in consistent harmony with the whole, at the end of the day, 
they will be counted unfaithful servants. And that is the unfortunate reality of what we're dealing in here. And I am not going to make any apologies for it. Although I may not be liked for saying it, it is the truth of the matter. And if the people that lived at that time were alive today, especially looking back over all the history that we have come down since that time, I still believe they would say the same thing. They would not change their mind. Hardly anyone talks about the history of the past hundred and some odd years. Why is that? Well, we're going to start looking into that, but it has relevance, okay? Um, but we build on the foundation that we already have. We don't make a whole new foundation. We don't tear down everything and say, well, they were wrong. No, we see Anyway, as we continue, I believe this will make more sense. We testify his existence and point to the evidence of his ever present providence in what is coming and shall come. We delight to recognize his all comprehending agency. We leap with joy when with this evidence that we are his witnesses, we hear him say, fear not, the very hairs of your heads are all numbered. Such are brethren to Paul, not in darkness, they having God can give meat in due season. Having Christ, they can confess him before men. Giving meat in due season, okay? If you are not firmly established on the past, then you're not going to be able in the present to give the Lord's people meat in due season. And we talked a little bit about that last Sabbath, one of the last quotes uh, that we read, which was a statement by James White, where he says, there are more that think, or there are some that think more of the future, understanding the future, than they do of understanding the past, which shows that they really have no foundation for even being able to understand the future, okay? They, they see no light in the past, but think they can find great light in the future. It just doesn't work that way. But I have seen that as a consistent principle among many people who profess to be quote unquote, teaching straight truth for this time. We'll get to that example in a moment. Those who know not God, either in his prophecy or providence are not his witnesses. They cannot be the Israel whom Jehovah cheers on to achieve the victories of faith. Such may tremble for their reputation, okay? So they, they may want to appear as good, solid Christians, or I even like this example here, by with Jesuits in their energy and policy, to get the honor that cometh from men. No one will work harder than a Jesuit, okay? To deceive and to trick, okay? But he who is not with me is against me, saith Jesus. The Jews, 1800 years since, could not deny the facts occurring. Around them, nor durst they deny the prophecies, but they deny that the facts of the life of Jesus fulfilled prophecy. Thus, they were not God's witnesses. You see, brethren, if we on one hand say we build the truth, while on the other hand tear down the truth, okay, we are not doing the Lord's work. So the few despised disciples who saw the hand of providence fulfilling prophecy were God's witnesses. Messiah assured them that they had nothing to fear from death or devils. John 10 verse 28 that people who would not believe both prophecy and providence had rejected all the light that God gives to sustain faith. Now, I've highlighted this here in bold italics, both prophecy and providence. Now, brethren, today, there are plenty of people that like to deal in prophecy, but yet at the same time do not understand providence. So I'm going to give you an example of what I'm talking about here. I came across this this week on Facebook. Somebody had posted this. Now, this is somebody that obviously likes to deal in prophecy because they call it a prophetic calendar of the last days. Looks pretty impressive. I mean, I have to admit, whoever put this together, I don't know. I'm suspicious now of who it might be, but whoever did this, they really work their mind hard to come up with this because, well, they've given this date 231 AD. I don't know how they figured that one out. Maybe that might be a calculation of the 6,000 years 
of which we're going to show is absolutely false. That cannot be true, but I think that's what they're doing. They're, they're taking the 6,000 years to, to 2031 AD, okay? But then look at this. The daily taken away, they're calling that the Sunday law. If you know anything about our historical message, you're going to begin to see the utter absurdity of what's being done here. They, they say the sixth seal has opened then, which means there are certain aspects of the seal would have to take place again, i.e. the falling of the stars, the dark day, uh, the, the earthquake. I mean, anyway, they've got the 1290 here. They put it in the future. Uh, they've reapplied the 1260-day prophecy, all right, under the seventh seal, the 1335. I mean, in essence, they've got a form of time setting here. Uh, obviously, uh, from if you buy into this, there's no way Christ is coming before 2031 AD. Uh, brethren, if we make it that far, I think we'll be lucky, honestly. I, I can't say a day or an hour. No man knoweth the day or announce the day or hour, but if we make it this far, we will be most fortunate. But the point is, if somebody worked really hard to put this together, okay, and then on top of that, uh, what appears is this statement around this chart. The 1260 and the 1290 and the 1335 can be taken as historic prophecy or secondarily as personal application prophecy starting after 1844. Now you tell me where they got that idea. They pulled that out of the hat, brethren. There is nowhere biblically that you have any ability to make a statement of that nature. Then they go on to say, the seven churches and seven seals can be for the sealing of the church in the first harvest, then the latter rain and trumpets, then the second harvest of the Gentiles and the close of probation. Now watch what they do here. Many Seventh-day Adventists, whether organizational or independent, that would indict us, right, will not hear good and the good and faithful servant while many in Babylon will come out and join God's faithful servants, okay? So in other words, what they're saying here is that, you know, if you don't buy into this insanity right here, okay, you're not one of God's good and faithful servants. I'm sorry, brethren. I'm not buying into that garbage. A lot of people are buying into, there's a myriad of these kinds of ideas. And we talked about this last week. The myriads are the methods of origin. This is mysticism. This is spiritualism. You're looking at it right here. And this is pawning itself off as Seventh-day Adventism, brethren. And there's probably a myriad of examples that could be given. This is just one that I came across this week, and I thought I would share it. So understanding or thinking they know prophecy, but having no understanding of providence, then what happens? Had rejected all the light God gives to sustain faith. Then they were in his way, and the wheels of providence must either stop. Okay, so it's like talking about last Sabbath about David Gates. Okay, either either God has to change everything about how he has worked uh, his principles and method of Bible study to understand prophecy. Okay, or and it's what happened with David Gates, and it will happen with so many others, or they will be crushed by its onward revolutions because they can make these predictions and they're not going to come to pass. Just so now, the professing churches, having taken their stand, denying that providence is fulfilling prophecy connected with the second advent, though they can neither deny the prophecies of such events nor the facts of their occurrence, must and will perish as did the Jewish nation. All the evidence which God grants is given when history testifies the truth of prophecy, consequently, if that is denied, Christ is denied. And wrath to the utmost will come on those who had till then been his acknowledged people. Okay? So this is a very dangerous thing that people are playing in. By how much the Christian church has had greater light than the Jewish, by so much more is their guilt greater and their revealed damnation more dreadful. Interesting enough, and I won't mention the minister's name, but somebody posted a short clip of him talking about how that, that yes, the greater condemnation would come upon uh, Seventh-day Adventists here at the end because they know more. And the reality of it is, is I've seen this man teach nothing uh, in the realm of truth as we understand as a prophetic people. He's come up with his whole own understanding of prophecy and uh, even identifies himself as someone who should be listened to and understood. And he merely condemns himself because 
All the evidence which God grants has been given. The history has testified to the truth of the prophecy. But if it is denied, then Christ is denied. And wrath to the utmost will come on those who had till then been acknowledged as his people. Okay, so this is a very serious thing we're dealing in. The doctrine as we find it in the scriptures should be distinctly stated in order to be correctly conceived. The doctrine is that there are no agencies adequate to give birth to predicted events such as God employs. Consequently, when they occur, we may know without a doubt not only that they are a fulfillment, but also that God has done it. So the Lord has literally walled off the devil in such a way that he cannot counterfeit the prophetic word in any way. He does not have permission to do that. What he can do is he can confuse, okay? He can get people to not use correct principles or to deny them or whatever and come up with their own ideas. But as far as the events themselves, he has no power to counterfeit them. God has done it in such a way that we need not be ashamed. And that's why Miller's rule number 13 is so important to us as we study prophecy. History and prophecy doth agree. And when we find that the history matches the prophecy word for word, we have a fulfillment because God has done it that way. And it can be no other way. If the events referred to have been witnessed, even though they be as unimportant in human estimation as the parting of our Savior's raiment or his burial in a rich man's tomb, it is the fulfillment of the prophecy. God in his providence has done it. We have got beyond those way marks on the prophetic track. They can never be witnessed again. God's word is the truth. The truth is the agreement between his word and the event as brought out in providence. I'm going to read it again. We have got beyond those way marks on the prophetic track. They can never be witnessed again. God's word is the truth. The truth is the agreement between his word and the event as brought out in providence. If the word names it but once and providence produces it or allows it twice, then there is not an agreement. You understand? There are no secondary fulfillments. There's no way to say, I think it'll happen again. That shows that you don't understand the nature of how God has taught us as a people to understand prophecy. And the, the tragedy of it is, is many professing Seventh-day Adventists are going to find themselves numbered with the infidels because they would not suffer themselves to be subjugated to the reality of what God has done. Just because a little bit longer has passed than they thought it should, they become impatient, whatever that may be, I don't know, but anyway, uh, it's not going to work out. Should providence grow slack as some can, men count slackness? Let Satan get the start and counterfeit the event. Agreement would not exist because the prophetic word notices no counterfeit with the genuine event. But we affirm on the highest and best authority, God's word is truth. The events of providence must agree. There will be no repetitions or false fulfillments where none are specified. When a predicted event occurs, it is the genuine. And that's what we're trying to figure out here with Daniel 11.45. Are we waiting for the genuine or has the genuine occurred? Where are we? Well, stay with us. We are bound to believe without doubt or wavering. There is an ease, a naturalness, a naturalness, a divinity about them which walls off all cause of doubt. It is true, doubts arise, but they spring from a source entirely disconnected from the prophetic fulfillment. Where do they spring from? From men's defiled hearts. From the heart, from the minds of men, the doubts arise. But there is no doubt in God's word. It is or it isn't. Let us illustrate by several recorded events in which the principle or doctrine as stated must be acknowledged just as far as the Bible is allowed to be true. We notice the creatures of every kind which went into the ark with Noah. The patriarch was told, yet seven days I will cause it to rain on the earth. Come thou and all thy house into the ark. Of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens. 
of the fowls also of the air by sevens, the male and his female, to keep seed alive upon the earth. This was the plan revealed 120 years before. Look at this. Okay, we've been talked about this uh, when we are in our time studies, the concept of self same day. Okay, pretty amazing. They picked up on this idea even back then, <laughs> which I think is quite interesting. That's why I put this here, self same day. But did Noah set traps to catch the birds? Did he make yokes or harnesses for the mighty lion and his mate and other creatures of less strength, but greater fierceness and rapacity? No, no, that would have been a greater labor than to have erected the ark. They came and went in two and two unto Noah into the ark, the male and his female as God commanded Noah. They seem to have come in one day because the waters of the flood were upon the earth after seven days. Their entrance was as natural as that of Noah himself. They came spontaneously like the subsequent descending flood. This event was a great, uh, was as great a miracle as the deluge and was adapted to sustain and settle the faith of Noah's family. And I would say also, brethren, to convict the antediluvians that were all standing around wondering, and I would say especially those that had one time helped Noah to build or had started with Noah and then have forsaken it. They had no fears that the old ship would founder or spring a leak after that. There was Jehovah's hand. The event occurred at the right time. God's providence concurred with Noah to fulfill his word. That cannot be counterfeited. The elevation of David to the throne of Israel and the entire history of that nation proves clearly the doctrine stated that there are no agencies adequate to fulfill prophecy, save such as God employs. And so let's turn together to Isaiah 44, verse 24, and read the verses mentioned here. And we read, thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb, I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself, that frustrateth the tokens of the liars, and maketh diviners mad, that turneth wise men backward, and maketh their knowledge foolishness, that confirmeth the word of his servant and performeth the counsel of his messengers that saith to Jerusalem, thou shalt be inhabited and to the cities of Judah, ye shall be built. And I will raise up the decayed places thereof that saith to the deep, be dry and I will dry up thy rivers. And then it's interesting here, it speaks of Cyrus. That saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built and to the temple, thy foundation shall be laid. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden to subdue nations before him. And I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two leaved gates and the gates shall not be shut. I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in sun to the bars of iron. And I will give thee the treasures of darkness and the hidden riches of secret places that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by name, am the God of Israel. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, mine elect, I have even called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. In other words, here we are seeing very clearly in Isaiah 44 and 45 that God providentially declares everything, even the calling of a man, Cyrus a pagan king, not even knowing that God was going to use him to free his people, although he did understand that after Daniel, the prophet showed him that prophecy and who he was. But even though he didn't understand what he was doing, the Lord knew what he was doing, and the Lord had providentially declared that he would do it. When a predicted event does occur, we may know that it is a fulfillment of the prediction. And that God's providence has interposed for its fulfillment. To such events, there are no seconds, any more than a second birth or baptism or burial of Messiah. The chariot of providence rolls by. The event looms up with God's seal impressed upon it. It never reoccurs. God has magnified his word above all his name. Therefore, all the leading events recorded in the history of the world have occurred as to time, circumstance, and connection 
with the past and the future according to God's word. Nothing which comes in competition with that word can stand before it. Read it again. Nothing which comes in competition with that word can stand before it. And today there are all kinds of things that are coming in competition with our historical message, brethren. There are even those that profess to be upholding the historical message while in other ways tearing it down by certain studies that they're producing. A ministry in particular that produced a study on the seven seals and the four horsemen while professing they're building up the truth with that very study denying the providence that we're talking about this evening would allow an open door for the very thing that we see here by those kinds of ideas, saying that the seals opened in 1844. You can see how teaching a doctrine like that would allow for a chart like this to be made, even though you're professing that you're printing the historical works of us as a people. You are tearing down the truth while at the same time professing to build it up. That cannot work, brethren. No, not even though it bear God's name. Okay, so you can put God's name on it, but it doesn't mean that it's true. Jerusalem, the temple, and the chosen seed must perish sooner than a jot or a tittle of the word should fail. Those attributes of wisdom and goodness and justice and mercy and power, which have secured a fulfillment of the sure word thus far, are all pledged to accomplish every minute or grand prophecy relating to the consummation. God in his word specifies each event. His people drink in the spirit by believing the word. They yield themselves up to his guidance and the province of God concurs when the event transpires. There will be nothing in all time like it. Settle that in your mind, brethren. There will be nothing in all time like it. Should any combination of agencies attempt a fulfillment, it would be like the false Christ out of the predicted time and out against the arrangements of the providence. Hence, they could not succeed. And I highlighted this here. Interesting, the prophecy relating to the Turks is an instance of the steady purpose of providence to allow no agencies to impend his purpose. In their rise, they prevailed in spite of all crusaders and all Christendom. Then at the expiration of their appointed time, they declined, though all the great Christian powers are in unholy league to sustain them. And this is where we're needing to figure out, are they still sustained? Are they still being held up? It is clear, or it is then, or it is then clear as scripture fulfilled can make it. There are no agencies which can counterfeit or derange the progressive fulfillment of the prophetic word. When the time arrives, each predicted event appears and God's providence must be recognized in it or we be convicted so as so far infidels. This is some serious things that we're dealing in this evening, brethren. And we should take it very seriously. God's providence must be recognized in it or we be convicted as so far infidels. Something else Adventists are not going to make it here at the very end. I don't have the power to judge anyone, but I can tell you this. If someone has the ability to know or to understand and refuses or fights against the truth of God's foundational message, as far as God is concerned, brethren, they're infidels and nothing less. Many confess the divine hand in the scores of prophecies fulfilled at the first advent of Jesus, but they imagine that he will not be very exact in honoring the predictions or teachings of his son relative to the second. They forget that God's word is but the second edition of himself, identified with himself, the transcript of his own mind. Have we not been talking about this? He must, to honor his word above all his name, maintain it, though it require the ruin of the professing church or the dissolution of the world. God's going to honor his word, brethren, whether seven day Adventists go along with it or not. Okay. It's going to be the way he said it's going to be. Okay. And if you're not willing to join with that, then he's going to number you with the transgressors. And it's easy to look back in the past and exalt these different men, but at the same time, now in the present, to forsake what or uh, the truth that he's given us or those that would uphold it, okay? 
Again, they forget that God's word is but the second edition of himself, identified with himself, the transcript of his own mind. My concern is to be found among the weak. I concur with this, brethren. That's my concern, and that's my desire for others, to be found among the wheat. I dare not deny the grace of our God, which I have enjoyed. Dare not deny that his word, more stable than the world, means something especially when expounded and the exposition written out by the finger of providence. We are now in our Advent experience where Noah was after the animals entered the ark. Brethren, we've been there for a little while, have we not? As it was in the days, the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the coming of the Son of Man. We have been waiting, so to speak, in the ark. Let's see, does God talk about the possibility that, that would be a reality? Turn with me to Habakkuk chapter 2. Habakkuk chapter 2. Habakkuk chapter two, and let's just read in verse one. Did God inform us that there would be a tearing time, that there would be a waiting, and that we should not forsake? I mean, what if they had decided that they wanted to get out of the ark? Okay, but you know, it's 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 uh it's not starts not started raining just yet. It's been three days, four days. We've been waiting in here. We need to get out. They've been in big trouble, right? Okay, so so are we gonna make? We don't want to make that mistake. I will stand upon my watch. And set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved or when I am argued with is the idea here. And the Lord answered me and said, write the vision, make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. Those tables, the 1843 and the 1850 charts, okay, because the 1843 chart is expressly the first angel's message and the 1850 chart is expressly the expansion of the third angel's message, okay? For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. We wait, brethren. We are to be found waiting faithful. The Lord promises that he's going to bless that servant who is found waiting and watching according to his word not the words of other men who have decided that they're not patient anymore and that they want to come up with something new and something witty. This divine interposition was to him the crowning testimony. He knew that God was with him. And this was security enough for faith. So the predicted events occurring in the Advent movement proved the presence of God by a special providence. We confess the promised presence and agency of him who confirmed Noah's faith by interposing to fulfill his word. We know that our God, who has guided, will guide those who concur with his providence to fulfill his word connected with the advent of Christ into the kingdom. Doubts to the winds now. Hallelujah. God is going to guide those who concur with his providence, okay? So if we want more light, if we want to understand leading up to the close of this world's history, we are going to have to set our feet firmly on what God has given us as our past understanding, or there will be no future light, okay? Um, and I will just leave it at that, all right? Uh, because there are so many people that are professing that they understand things about the future while utterly denying and, and criticizing, condemning, shaming anyone that would hold to the foundations of our faith as a people. Those who reflect on us seem not to see themselves. They assume that their conception of the advent must be realized as if their theory of prophetic fulfillment was more trustworthy than the providence of God. When fulfilling his word, this brethren was the sin and consequent ruin of the Jews. Instead of correcting their mistakes, as did the despised disciples, by providence and prophecy, they stood on their original faith. Messiah must come according to their conceptions. There they stood in a fixed position till their house was left unto them desolate. The disciples, on the contrary, saw scripture being fulfilled. Therefore, they moved down the track of truth with providence. Had they stopped, 
they would have been left and lost. We dare not follow an example so fatal, so sinful as that set by the Jews. I would be a disciple, however much despised. We dare not follow an example so fatal and so sinful, brethren, as the Jews did. And we are today modern Israel. Please, let's not make the same mistake. Anyone that hears this message, I pray you will hear the Lord's voice calling to you to come out of this delusion of futurism and of messing with our message because it is delusion. It is mysticism. And I don't care how nicely and how well they speak on other subjects and topics, brethren. They are not in agreement with God's providence. Our experience in this respect harmonizes with that of God's people at every epoch in our world's sad history. They have all made mistakes just like ours. Notwithstanding, they were honored of God to act the part assigned his people. The disciples all forsook him and fled. Yet even in that, they fulfilled Zechariah 13, 7. They had inadequate conceptions of God's revealed plan. Luke 18, 31 through 34, though being fulfilled before them, now, it would be passing strange if believers in this age of glory and wonder should have surpassed patriarchs, prophets, and apostles in their accuracy of their conceptions of Jehovah's purposes or of the manner in which he would accomplish them. Okay, so you think that patriarchs, prophets, and apostles who in their past did not understand necessarily the prophetic word of God and how it would play out, okay? You think today we're smarter than them? I seriously doubt it. They weren't being sprayed from the air. Their water wasn't being poisoned. Their food wasn't being GMO'd. They weren't like literally emerged in all kinds of invasive and subversive and distracting technologies, okay? And, and they made mistakes in the conceptions of how God would finish things and work things out, okay? So we're better? I think not. Then to maintain that we have been wiser in this respect than all the divinely instructed of other ages after God's providence has proved as not so, invinces that pride which precedes destruction and that haughtiness which goes before a fall. In confessing the doctrine of providence, we confess a present God. This the text teaches. We confess the supremacy of the present deity. His plan comprehends agents voluntarily and involuntarily. The drama is arranged as sketched in prophecy. The scenes change, the actors appear and perform their part, and the entire movement in the theater of earth proceeds in harmony with the published plan. For providence is the master of ceremonies. O oh Lord, give us grace and we will confess thee before men. Be witnesses for thee that thou hast set in order from ancient time and declared it. No agency can defeat or derange the order which thou hast declared. When the predicted event occurs in the prescribed order, we confess the truth of Jesus. It does occur. It does take place by the direction of providence, a present God. As Noah knew that God was with him when he saw the creatures coming two and two unto the ark, as Joseph knew his vision to be from God when his brethren were bowing before him, as Moses, mother, and David's friends knew that God was with them by fulfillment of his word, as the apostles knew Jesus to be the Messiah by events and his works, According to scripture, so we know without a doubt that the Advent movement is divine in its origin, divine in its progress, divinely glorious will be its results. Amen. Now, I took highlights from that article. I would highly recommend that anyone who was on this call this evening or anyone who would hear this message that you would read it all for yourself. But I'm going to tell you what it really boils down to when people are misusing prophecy 
okay, in one way or another and are not working under the order of providence. I invite you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. And we will be in verse 42. Let's start in verse 42. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come, but know this, that the goodman of the house had known in what watch the thief would come. He would have watched it would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Okay, so if we could really know exactly when God was coming, if we could somehow, you know, manipulate, you know, these days and the things that they're doing now and all the stuff that they're saying, if we could somehow do that, well, then we could prevent the thief from making his way in. The Lord's giving us a principle. We don't know. We can know the season. We can know when we're close to the time, but we don't know exactly when. Therefore, be also ready for at such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Who is God going to use to give the meat or the food that needs to be eaten at this time in due season? Who is that? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. And what is he doing? He's waiting and he's watching. He's waiting and watching according to what he understands from the past. He does not let go of his birthright as Esau did for a morsel of bread, okay? For some accolade of the people, for some financial stability. He does not do such a thing. Verily I say unto you that he shall, be make, that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But, and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming. And how do they say my Lord delays his coming? By messing with the understanding of providence, by changing these things around, by switching them up. What will happen? And shall begin to smite his fellow servants, okay? So he will abuse them because they don't agree with him. And to eat and drink with the drunken becomes drunk on the wine of Babylon or the wine of error. What will happen? The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him and in an hour that he is not aware of and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with who? With the hypocrites, or as we read in this doctrine of providence, with the infidel. Then shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth because these were God's professed people, God's professed ministers or God's professed followers who missed it because they were deceived. Let that not be any of us. And so we must understand this principle of providence if we will go forward in understanding the nature of the king of the north. Because there is every wind of doctrine blowing around it, for sure. And even among those who might even prescribe to understand it to be the Ottoman Turk, perhaps there might even be some misunderstanding there. So we had to cover this principle first before we could go any further. And with that, I'm going to close with prayer. Father, again, I come to you, name your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you for your love and mercy. I thank you for providence in the sense that we know that you govern over our lives and that nothing happens to us without your will. Anything from as great as our murder to as insignificant as the plucking of a hair from our head it doesn't happen without your direction or guidance. But in the grand scheme of prophetic truth and what it means to be a Seventh-day Adventist, I pray that you would wake your people up to understand the nature of the things that we're dealing in right now, the dangers that are involved now with taking our hand off the wheel of truth and coming up with something witty or trying to invent something new because a little more time has passed than we think should have passed. Please help us. Please help this ministry to go forward and do what it's called to do. Please help all those that would listen to these things to understand the nature and depth and the magnitude of what's being spoken of here. And I thank you for your love and mercy to us. And I pray these things in the mighty of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and in the glory of our Heavenly Father. Amen. 